All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, I'll introduce myself first. My name's Ethan Law. I'm the community manager for Rio. Um, and today we're really lucky to have Ken Morish with us of the Morish Mouse and many other patterns. Um, and I'll let him kind of introduce himself a little bit here. Ken, tell us about yourself. <laughs> well, I'm just glad to be here. And uh, yeah, we got the technology working and that's always the hardest part of the evening. So uh, yeah, but uh, I'm an Ashland, Oregon resident. Uh, I am a employee of Firebank and one of the founders of Flywater Travel. Uh, but uh, one of the things I really like doing is time flies, and I've been doing it for a while, and tonight we're going to go over a real basic one. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So a little story about Kenny's mouse. Uh, my first night fish came on the Moorish mouse on the West Branch of the Delaware River like eight years ago. Um not not a lot. I was fishing like a really small one, like a size six or eight, I think, about as small as they get. Um, and I was scared out of my mind by like deer crossing the river and all the night noises, but uh, I got over it and uh, night fishing super fun. So uh, cool. So Ken, I'm going to do my best to keep up with you. I'm not going to lie. I haven't tied a deer hair or elk hair fly in a long time. So bear with me, but I'm sure yeah. you'll do a great job teaching me. Well, hair is typically a mess, and uh, and so yeah. Tonight, I'm just going to tie to keep it simple. I'm going to tie on a, a a 52, 62, number four. Usually, we tie it on a three X long hook, but if I get away doing it with a two X long hook, it'll take a little less time to do all the repetitive and uh, messy deer hair spinning, and so. Yeah, we'll sort of start with that. And what I like to say, the first step in the fly tying for me is always to get a little sandpaper. I like a old piece of 220 grit, and I like to sand the top of my left thumb and forefinger and a little bit on the other thumb and forefinger just so I don't break my thread or fray mm. it when I'm tying. If you fish a lot, your hands are probably pretty... Uh, messed up and cracked from that and so that's my first thing the second thing i always like to do in tying is i like to really make sure that those scissors are right on my ring finger so i'm not running around looking for them the whole time and uh and then with that i'm just going to get a little bit of a brown bunny strip it could be any color but Brown's pretty nice for, for this pattern. And I'm going to begin the fly with the bunny tail element. And I'm just and Ken, Ken I'm sorry to interrupt. What got you started into fly tying? Like, did you guide or were you just fly fishing and didn't see the flies you need? Like, how did that begin for you? You know, I was, uh, I started tying and fishing at a pretty young age. I started tying when I was about eight or nine. Uh, and my dad had a, a little fly tying box and he tied really basic sort of Klamath River steelhead flies. And he taught me one summer just how to tie a, a brindle bug. And, you know, by the time I was 10, I could probably tie him better than he could. And then he, he promptly stopped tying and just placed his orders with me. And so yeah, smart man. Yeah, exactly. So I did a lot of a lot of tying uh, early on, and I I tied pretty. I tied really seriously all through my my teens, and uh, my dad was a pretty serious fly fisherman, and and his dad, and and even his father. So it was kind of the we call it the mutant gene in the family, and. Uh, yeah, so he he got me going awesome. on all aspects of it, and and he's he's still fishing today at, at ninety one, which is kind of nice. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So hey, so what we're gonna do on this first step is we're just gonna take the back end of this leather strip, the part that's facing the, the natural flow backwards, and I'm just gonna grab that in the jaw with the leather facing me, 
And then I'm going to keep a little, a small long tuft in the back, maybe a quarter inch or so. And the rest of this, I'm just going to wet down a little bit to get it out of the way. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to trim out all of this long hair here. So these little razor scissors are really nice for this. And I'll just come and cut it really nice and close along there. So that's going to be sort of step one. And there's the beginning of my tail. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I always want to cut the back of this leather into a nice tapered point. I hate seeing those sort of square points on, on leather. It doesn't need to be that way and it's not a very natural look. But there's my basic tail. And one Do you find trick, it swims better at all with the like, have you tested it? Like, yeah. No, Seems like I that's a thing. I, I just think it's a, a, a little classier looking. I don't think it's any more effective. I just think the other is kind of ugly. And, and so what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to trim a little point on the tie in side of the leather. And that's just going to make it so when I tie it in, it's less bulky and not a, not making a big mess there. And sometimes if your leather is really thick, you can even sort of thin that leather down there and trim it down. This is kind of a nice thin piece. And then I want to show you guys a little trick that I recently came up with. It's not difficult to have bunny tails wrap around the bend of the hook and not fish as well as they can. So if you like, you can get like a little UV cure here. I like the Solarez hard thin. And with a little, in a little quarter inch area at the back of the tail, sort of stopping shy of the taper we cut in, just put a little bead line right down there. I don't know if you can see that, but then I'm gonna go ahead hmm. and I'm gonna cure that. And that is gonna give us a little rigidity. See, it doesn't wanna bend there anymore. And that's sort of my prepped tail. So that so keeps that, it from getting wrapped around the hook a bunch and stuff like that. Exactly. because That's a great tail, idea. Yeah, the tail gets really limber and in the water. And yeah, if you're flicking it around a bunch, you could easily get it wrapped. It's still fishes wrapped, but I'd rather fish it unwrapped. And like, what was the impetus of this fly? Like where... Where did this come up with in your head? Was it filling a need? Was it just like, hey, I want to tie a mouse that looks rad? Like, uh, it certainly wasn't one tied to look rad. It was, <laughs> it was, you know, this is a simple three step fly. It's the simplest fly that I've ever put out on the market, but it did really have a function. And really, it, in about 2002, I was going to make my first trip to Kamchatka. And I Not bad. It was What's that? Yeah, not bad trip. Yeah, that was yeah, and I knew there was a lot of mousing opportunities there, and I also knew that the river I was heading to would be a pretty good light tackle opportunity. And the thing I really wanted out of this deal is I wanted a high floating and easy casting mouse, and I wanted one that I could cast on a five weight effectively. And I didn't want a bunch of mass to it. So what I was really shooting for was sort of maximum profile and minimum amount of materials. And so that was sort of the impetus for that. Cool. And as a result, when I originally tied them, I tied them pretty loosely without a bunch of hair. I didn't really stack the hair in there and make it super tight. It was a, a more sparse fly. And as it's developed as a commercial pattern it's better tied than my original ones and it's even more tight in uh in the amount of hair it uses but it's, it's really nice the way they do it commercially and what i'll do today will sort of be right in between the original one and the current production one where it's not i'm not really cramming as much hair in there as humanly possible good so i'm not real bent on what hook you guys use 
if uh, you know your hook should just serve your purpose. But again, I'm going to use a 5262 number four. Usually, I would tie on a 3x long hook. This is a 2x long. My first move is always going to be to get rid of that barb because if you need a fish in your hands so badly that you need that barb, maybe you should be spear fishing or something. I don't know, but uh, but now I'm just going to go back and I'm going to start my thread really where I'm going to tie my tail in, leaving that shank nice and open. And Ken, what thread do you prefer for this? Uh, yeah, good question. You know, these days I like a ADOT Vivas, real strong. Wow. Yeah. And it's hard for me to break. And uh, yeah, that, that's what I like to use. But there's, I'm not a real stickler on the details. As long as people sort of get, get the fly structurally to work right, that's the most important thing. Cool. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tie that tail down and I'm sort of going right up against that little bead of cure there. I'll trim the excess off there a little bit and I'll firm that up in a second or something else. Now, the next step is gonna to be to tie in the foam. And this is quarter inch foam. Sometimes you find it in sheets. Sometimes you can get it in pre-sliced uh, strips like that, but it's a thick heavyweight foam. You could glue two pieces of eighth inch together if you wanted, if you didn't have the really thick stuff. And the main move we're gonna do here is we're just gonna go right into the middle of the piece of foam. And then we're gonna try to cut a relatively long, shallow angle up one side. We'll flip it over. Try to do that again. And this one didn't turn out super symmetrical. I'm not stoked with that. So shit, I'll do it again. Now, Ken, when you design flies, are you generally trying to be like imitative of a specific bug or like just more suggestive in general? Well, I think I'm definitely not what I would call a realistic tire. I'm not, I'm not a big, I mean, I'm a fan of seeing how people tie realistic flies and I'm impressed by sort of the artistry of it. But I think that the, the suggestive and impressionistic is, is, the most important, but I'm a real, I'm a stickler for silhouette and profile. You know, those are the things that matter most. And then I really am into sort of the engineering part of it. You know, how do you tie the fly so it performs properly? How does it have the right density and material so it floats right or so it sinks right or so it's balanced? So those are the things I'm, I'm mostly into. And, you know, this fly, the, you know, the finished Moorish mouse is really uh, suggestive, impressionistic. It is not at all a realistic fly. It doesn't have ears or whiskers or little legs. It's, a, it's, it's as general and vague as it could be. And, you know, that's what you get if it's a three-step fly. But some of the greatest flies in the world are three-step flies. You know, like the woolly bugger, that might be the greatest fly of all. You know, if you had to pick one fly to catch every species of fish in the world and you could scale it uh, to different sizes and different hooks, that's a great fly. This fly, with the basic engineering principles of it, is highly scalable as well. And, you know, like for... Uh, example like a new fly I've got coming out in in recent in new seasons for Rio you know here's a really big skating rat wow. that's a skate rat and it's basically the same principles as the Moorish mouse but instead of going through the trouble of spinning the hair I've used a dubbing brush and then I've doubled back the foam here to give it even more floating mass, added some rubber legs, 
added a little trick so this tail will never wrap uh, sort of gluing foam into it. And so it's the same basic design. And while it's not at all realistic, uh, it it's engineered in a way that it does the job that I want it to. And so that's, cool. that's the important thing. Yeah. So if you, it, if you don't like cutting the foam and making these long cuts, some people find that challenging. You know, there are some, some interesting contraptions out there, like there's a, a foam cutter that's been made that you can purchase through Hairline. And, you know, this, what I've cut will, you know, basically fit into that profile pretty well. So there's uh, a, a crutch to go around it if you want, but that's the River Road Creation uh, foam cutter. Nice. Sorry. You're too popular, Ken. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know how to use the camera on the phone without having it ring. Uh, so uh, once I have this little piece of foam here, I'm going to cut a taper hmm. in the back of it. And that's going to be my tie-in point here. So I'm going to just lay that right on up, to, uh, right on up against the tail there. And I'm going to tie that down, and I'm going to make sure I go right up against the leather, and then tie that down. Get a little more light here. Now, before I do the next step, I'm going to flip the fly upside down and I'm just going to give it a little bit more UV cure and I might go right up against the leather base of that tail to sort of finish that stiffening process to keep that tail from wrapping give it a little zap of cure now I know you said this fly was originally for your come shot cook trip but like for your nymphs and like your dry flies are those with western rivers near you in mind or do you kind of think more globally for the patterns that i tie yeah like the like your stone fly nymph and like yeah you know a lot of my stuff uh, is is based on more or less local trout fishing i try to focus most of my commercial fly design on the trout market because that that is the market right specialty flies like giant skating rats or jungle flies or steelhead and salmon flies they're much more of a, a niche market but i like to i like to design flies for virtually every fishing trip i go on i mean my thing is like hey i want to i want to fish with what i want to fish with i spend too much time thinking about fishing and before I go on trips, tying for them is, is, is sort of half of the fun. And a lot of times the, the process of tying and coming up with a creative pattern may end up be, being even more enriching than the actual day on the water. You know, I just don't know, right? So, so because I've been able to travel so much with fly water travel, I've gotten to go see a lot of different places. And it's pretty important for me personally to tie before I do those trips. And so sometimes the inspiration has come from faraway places where I'm going. And sometimes those ideas translate really well back into my home waters. But I'd say it's a real mix. It's not a, it's not one or the other. It's just sort of what's next for me. All right. Cool. Yeah. Not that um, your fluttering stonefly wouldn't work in Montana or somewhere else, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. you know, basically so many of the the life forms are similar you know a mouse a stonefly a caddis a mayfly they look the same irrespective of their continent right and, and so most of the stuff if you really just pay attention to the natural shapes of things they're going to translate really well you know me sometimes with an adjustment in color or something like that or size so as we move into the the hair portion of the fly you know this is uh this is dark cow elk hair and you could use 
a lot of different types of hair. You could use deer hair, you could use antelope if you wanted, and you shouldn't at all be afraid to use dyed hair. Like this is quite gray, and this is sort of the original recipe, and it works great. You could mark this up with a pen afterwards if you wanted, or you could use dyed elk hair. The dyed elk hair is more brittle and not as durable as the, the natural undyed stuff, but it, uh, yeah, it works well. So awesome. in this case, I'm just gonna get a small bunch and I've still got my fly upside down here. I'm just gonna take a small bunch. I'm gonna clean that out. And then I'm gonna do over and over again what I call hand stacking. So as opposed to using a hair stacker to get a little more natural edge, I'm just gonna have a loose grip and we'll go over this a few more times. And I'm gonna align those tips that way to give it a, a little rougher natural look. And here, I'm gonna go ahead and pre-trim this over my trash can to a little over an inch long. And then I'm gonna make sure that my thread is really close to the tail. And what I wanna do is sort of mask that tail and foam tie-in area. So I'm gonna lay this in here and this is one of the rare instances where I'm going to use my left hand and take the thread around with my left hand. I'm going to give it two slack wraps, maybe clear some of these around the other side of the bend. And then I'm just going to give that a gentle pinch to flare that. I'm going to sort of fold those butts back and just gently wrap through there and push that stuff down and back out of the way. That move isn't essential. You could just start with the fly right side up and start spinning. But when you trim it out, you're going to see that whole work area where you tied in the leather and the tail. And it's not going to make a big difference. It's just a little tidier looking package that way how are you doing over there Ethan? Is it going you know there? better than expected i still got it <laughs> yeah, i still got it yeah well the messy redundant part is going to begin now i never believed when you started working for a fly company that you stopped tying flies as much and just using them but your flies work so well i just like don't tie as much anymore so exactly <laughs> One of the things I like most about being a fly designer is typically once I introduce a pattern, I never have to tie it again. That's a good point. <laughs> I got to get on that. I had to go back and relearn how to tie this uh, the, the, over the past week, which was kind of funny and definitely messy. So now I'm going to go back in and now we're going to begin the spinning, the spinning process. So now I'm going to get a little bit larger bunch of elk hair here. I'm gonna sort of use a pinch grip here where I pinch it square against my fingers. Now I'm gonna use my comb and I'm gonna bring all that under hair out and I'm gonna clean my comb now so it's ready on my next go. And I'm just gonna have this stuff fly all over the place. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and hand stack again. So I sort of got a loose three finger grip on it and I'm just gonna push this together. Obviously you can use a hair stacker and if you, you'll get a really tidy look, but still with this, you get a really pretty good stack. It just gives it a little more of a natural edge and look. And I don't mind that. I pre-trimmed it to just over an inch, inch and a quarter long. And now I'm just gonna keep about a quarter inch of those butts sticking out and I'm gonna tie that in with two wraps. I'm gonna sort of gently press and spread these hairs down. And then I sort of hold on to some of the hairs on my side as I wrap it forward. So in this case, I'm not letting it spin. 
you can absolutely let it spin. And that would be the traditional thing to put those two wraps in and then pull tight and sort of chase it forward as the whole bundle spins. And that works well, but you might get a little less consistent thing. There might be more hairs on one side or the other. But as soon as I wrap through that, I'm in front of, of that last bunch. It kind of looks like a little muddler head about to be trimmed up there. I'm gonna compress it and push it back a little bit, but not a lot. Cause like I say, I don't want this super tight and packed out. It just makes it so the fly takes a lot longer to cast, a lot longer to tie and a little more cumbersome to cast. So I'm not making this like a really beautiful, tightly packed bass bug. I'm impressed by those, but this, this, like I say, I want this to be easy to cast. Now, Ken, I'm curious, do you ever add floating to this? Yeah, almost okay. invariably, yeah. When I fish it, I, I, I definitely like to add floating to it. And I even add it to the foam. The only part I don't want to add it to is to the very fluffy tip of the rabbit. I'd rather keep that sort of free flowing and moving. But uh, yeah, floating cool. helps quite a bit. All right, we're going to go again. Another bunch. This is a great time to ask me questions because I got <laughs> this a bunch of times. Perfect. I was actually <laughs> going to ask how you fish. How do you prefer to fish this? Like I will. I've done it a couple of ways where I've cast at 45 degrees down and just kind of let it swing. And that's been my most effective. And I know it's different for everyone. I've done it where I've, you know, cast down and wiggled the tip as it goes, little strips, all sorts of things. But how do you prefer to fish it? Yeah, I like to fish it uh, across and or down and across. And I like to fish it with a really high rod tip and sort of mm. pulse it as it comes through. And yeah, that that's my favorite way to do it. And so it's just sort of a small pulse. It's sort of similar to how I fish uh, steelhead skaters, except I fish an even higher rod tip with the mouse. And I want to be really patient when the fish eats it and sort of just bow down to it and not go tight to the fish too soon. That's that's the big thing is, is being patient, giving them a real opportunity to eat it and, uh, and don't pull it away from them. And how many different species have you caught with the mouse? Oh, you know, uh, on yeah, variations of the mouse I've caught. Timon and Dorado and bass and trout and steelhead, I've caught lake trout, I've caught grayling. Wow. Uh, lake trout. Yeah. So it's a it's a pretty versatile pattern. The further north you go, the better it seems to work. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I guess when you get go way down south too, it, 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 but yeah, the 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 more extreme latitudes, the fish seem to be awfully receptive to this type of fly. And I think there's just a lot more rodents uh, seasonally available to the fish in those areas. All right, again, one more hand stack. There's sort of a loose three finger grip there. Open up your palm, push it against it, give it a quick rotation. Do it again, trim it off about an inch and a quarter long, lay it down with quarter inch of butt sticking out, give it two wraps. When you pull tight on this, pull straight off of the reel or the thread spool as opposed to at an angle because you'll break your thread if you do it that way. Spread it out a little bit, both sides. And then I'll sort of hold on to this side of the bunch and wrap forward and give it a little compression backwards. Ken, what was the first tie that got picked up commercially for you? Was it this? This was out a long time ago. You know, it, it, it wasn't. My, my first was a, a pattern called uh, the Dirty Bird. And it's still, you know, it's still maybe the most versatile 
trout nymph that I fish with. And it's kind of like a, yeah, kind of like a black beaded bird's nest with a fuzzy body and a partridge hackle. And it's, it's just a, a great fly. But the Moorish mouse was probably in the first five flies that I commercially designed for Idlewild. And, uh, yeah, and that was a good chapter working with them. And, uh, and that's where I first started working with Patrick Kilby, who along with Britta Fordyce runs Rio Flies. And so, uh, yeah, so Patrick and I have a long working relationship and it's really pretty exciting for me to be working with him and to be working again with the factory in the Philippines that Rio utilizes. And, and there's a, I have a very uh, dear friend there who has overseen quality control for that factory for a long time. And it's always been far and away the best quality commercial products that I've been involved with. I, I spent, oh, I don't know, five or six years with a, a larger Colorado based company that was hard for me to, uh, it's hard for me to look at my samples uh, often. And so I'm pretty stoked to be back with, with what I feel what is the, the best factory running and uh, to work with Patrick again, that I've had a really great working relationship with in the past. So that's, that's I've got a good chapter coming ahead of me with, uh, with Rio that I'm pretty stoked about. Yeah, I'll say working in fly shops and seeing all sorts of different quality and flies and stuff, the Rio flies, I'm not just saying this, are really, really excellent. And they're really true to the pattern, which you don't always find, um, yeah. which is really great. And uh, tell you what, Patrick and Britta, if I ever post anything that uh, has a whole fly box and one of them isn't a Rio fly, they can pick it out. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. They're on it. <laughs> They're on it. Yeah, they, they are. They, they do a great job. And uh, yeah, it, it really it really is a, a super factory. I was always in awe of the flies that came out of there. And while I've never been to the Philippines, I kind of wanted to go and I wanted to see what this factory, I, I, I want to watch these tires tie because I'm, I'm so impressed by what they do and you know it they they're way better at tying my patterns than i am and obviously they they tie a heck of a lot more of them than i do i always say that by the time i'm done completing my samples for production that only when i'm really done with the whole thing do i really start having a proper understanding of the fly you know it sort of takes me that many times and and sample time's hard for me. I don't like I don't like tying things the same. I, uh, you know, a lot of times the stuff I'm doing now, you know, it might take me 20 iterations to get the pattern where I want it, and then I start doing the repetitive samples. And by the time I'm done with those samples, then I typically have a a clue how to tie my own flies. Just so a little inside baseball, like samples have to be very exact, perfect, and you have to be able to repeat them exactly in order for yeah. them to pass the process for. So if you ever submit a fly, make sure they look exact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I always want to send off my very best ones. And I, I sort of keep my seconds from that process for my own collection because, yeah, I want them to come back looking that way. And it's not long before that factory is showing me flies, my own patterns tied with, with greater tightness and precision and consistency than my samples. You know, it's, it, it invariably goes that way. And, and yeah, interestingly, I'd sort of say that the, the Moorish mouse got improved over time by the factory in the Philippines. Hmm. And, in most fly tying situations, the opposite happens. There's a lot of drift away from the original pattern, and uh, that can be a pretty frustrating process. Hey, so Ethan, I'm here. I'm going to see if I can get away with this being my last plunge. <laughs> I want to save some some space at the, at the front for getting the foam tag down there. Yeah, I'm out of room, so uh, I'm using a little shorter shank hook than you, so good luck. Yeah, good, good. Well, I can <laughs> say the short shank is the great way for cheating on the demo. 
Exactly. So, Are there any tires that like you follow and take inspiration from? Well, I mean, you know, when I'm sort of looking around on social media and stuff, I'm, I'm amazed by all kinds of tires out there. But in terms of tires that have historically influenced me, um, I had a pretty, I had a pretty great teacher uh, early on when I was, uh, you know, a real early teen. A guy named Andy Puyans, and, and a lot of the guys that he taught were my initial teachers, and then he taught me later. And I liked his stuff, but I also was a big uh, follower and fan of Bob Quigley's flies. Hmm. And while Bob and I, well, I was sort of chasing Bob Quigley around and his flies for a lot of my life, but we didn't really become friends and meet until much later in life uh, when he moved to Ashland here. But I always liked his tying growing up. But my number one guy uh who I've never met is, is Dave Whitlock. And, mm. uh, you know, to me, he's a real Renaissance tire and angler on a lot of levels. You know, he's a guy who can, you know, deliver you a perfectly scientifically accurate drawing of any kind of aquatic insect or a sculpin or any species of fish. And so he understands structurally how bugs look and how different fish foods look and he did a book uh, that I bought when I was young called uh, Dave Whitlock's Guide to Aquatic Trout Foods mm -hmm. and to be able to look at his his line drawings of these things really simplified stuff and, and clarified the shape of, of bugs and then his tying i just thought was really innovative really versatile he was really good with color he was good with shape and uh yeah i just he was kind cool. of my favorite uh, so right now i'm just going to give this a combing out and i'm going to try to comb out the bottom a bit that's hard for me to see i'm not using a, a rotary vice for this fly i really just sort of want a fair trap for this one but I, I do use a rotary one for other stuff so I'll give that a little combing out and now it's going to get messy so now we're going to just come right in on the top and we're going to cut this down pretty deeply right back to the foam there I learned very late in the game, it's helpful to have a mini vacuum right next to your desk on hand, ready to go. Jeez, yeah, I could, I, I'd like to have one of those. <laughs> My fly time cavity, I usually start cleaning it out with a shovel and then move it. Oh. So I'm going to go and I'm going to cut that a little flatter there. And then I can also pull down the long strands and just sort of clean out some of these shorter strands. And here I'm just sort of trying to make that fairly symmetrical. Looks like that's working out for the time being. If I want, I can cut a little taper in the front hair here because it's going to be easier now than later, but I'll probably go back and do that again. Okay, so now before I tie this down, this foam's really thick and it's pretty stiff. So I'm going to go to the area where I'm going to tie it down and I'm going to pinch it and I'm basically going to compress it a little bit. And that's going to make it so that my thread's going to mm. dig in there better and it's going to get a better purchase. I've got a little open space here at the eye and I've got a little thread base there. I'm going to go sort of move to the middle of that thread base. I'm not going to tie this in totally against the deer hair. I'm going to slide forward a little bit and that's going to help me out a couple of different ways. So I'll pull this nice and tight. I'll actually roll the foam slightly towards me and then I'll get a good hard draw off of the spool of the thread as opposed to pulling sideways, not to break it. You don't wanna break it right now. And once I get about five wraps or six wraps there, I'm gonna go and bend this up and then I'm gonna go lay my thread 
down and make a small cone there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time building that up, but I might give it six or seven wraps. And then I'm just going to go in and whip finish it there. I can't see the eye, but I know it's down there somewhere. <laughs> As long as there's no glue in there, then exactly. we're good. Trying to unglue an eye in the middle of the night is not necessarily fun. Yeah, exactly. If you're fishing, that's the worst. All right. Well, made it through that without breaking my thread. Twisted that one up, so to speak. And I'm just going to comb this out a little bit more, and then we're going to do a little more trimming and a little more gluing. Before I take the fly out of the vise, my overlap here, sort of my front lip's a little bit long. So I'm going to trim that a little bit shorter. And will that and affect the way it swims at all? Like, or just a more of a look preference thing? Well, it, if you leave that lip really long it'll greatly affect the way it casts uh, and it won't improve the way it casts it'll make it <laughs> a, a lot harder to cast and it'll make the fly helicopter a lot more and it'll also change the profile so yeah it sort of matters if the lips too short then the fly might not plane on the surface as well mm -hmm. as i would like and so yeah i'm i'm pretty specific about that I don't know. It's about, well, it's more than a quarter inch and less than a half inch. It's right in, in that range. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bevel the belly of this, uh, of this lip. So I'm going to cut that so it has mm. sort of a ramp for the water to go up. And then I'm going to bevel the edges. Huh. And if you like that top the top outer corners can also get beveled there. And that's kind of the, the look I want for the finished head. And that just helps it swim properly. Is there a knot you like to use for this when you're you know, fishing it? I, I tend to fish this with a straight clinch knot. I don't use improved clinch knots. I use traditional clinch knots and I use loop knots. So that those are sort of my two go-tos, but I don't feel like I need extra motion. And, and if, if this fly is tight to the eye, I like that because it's not going to twist itself up in any unexpected ways. Nice. All right. So now I'm going to go in and trim out the belly. This is going to sort of have a tapered cut back. It's going to be a little wider at the front. And now I'm sort of rolling that cut around to the side a little bit. I needed to vacuum my office. So after this, I'll have a good reason to. Perfect. And so I'm just sort of cutting this out and getting a little bit of a rounded belly shape in there. And what I'm really looking for as I do it is, is just trying to get an even amount of material on both sides. And you can fuss around trimming this thing forever. <laughs> and it ain't going to fish any better. So right now... That's about all we need to do to have this thing be ready for, for action. And then one last thing I like to do, is I like to get, oh, actually I'll put this upside down in the vise. I'm gonna do another UV cure here, but in this case, I'm gonna sort of pull the head down a little bit, the foam. I'll rub a little back into the deer here just for some added strength. And then pull that around back and forth a little bit. And then as I cure it, I'm gonna pull down on it slightly as I cure it. 
Mm. And that will just really encourage the angle where this thing's going to plane and never, never dip under. Sweet. This is a lot of stuff I didn't do when I first tied it. So great to know. Nice. And yeah, there's a ratty little Moorish mouse, a very messy three-step fly that for whatever reason works really well. I can attest to that. <laughs> Ken, thanks for coming on with us. We really appreciate it. Um, everyone, you can check out Ken's flies at rioproducts.com under Signature Tire. He's got a bunch on there. I've used a couple on the Yak. Uh, it's stonefly season over there. Um, and look for more of his new patterns coming out soon, like his rat. My, uh, my friend Chris, who is watching this, is definitely drooling at that rat because he has to have every mouse pattern that exists. So Good. Hey, well, thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, really appreciate the time. And uh, good job on your white back mouse. Thanks. I, you know, it came better than I thought it would. So I think that'll fish. I'm ready. Yeah, that, that, that'll hunt. Awesome, Ken. Well, have a good night. Thanks, everyone, right, for tuning in. All right. Thank you.